Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or whatever time it is that you are worshiping with us here on our online worship for First United Methodist Church of Hanover. Welcome. My name is Pastor Greg Rapp, Senior Pastor at First United Methodist Church, and we are coming to you from the sanctuary of our Frederick Street campus. Uh, this weekend is the third Sunday of Advent, and we have taken the liberty of lighting the third candle on the Advent wreath, and we're going to talk a little bit about that a little bit later. Um, Christmas is coming close, but remember, as we've been saying over recent weeks, Christmas or Advent is not about getting ready for Christmas. It's about getting ready for Christ to return, to establish his eternal kingdom when everything will be just exactly the way God intends it to be. And my friends, that is going to be great. Can't wait for it, and I'm sure you can't either. So with that joy and expectation, we're going to start this worship service with a song. grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us to Jesus Christ our Lord to whom with you and the Holy Spirit the honor and glory now and forever in his name we light this third candle of Advent that Christ may fill us with the boldness of the Holy Spirit to defend the defenseless amen This baby boy who came to earth to bring us joy And I just want to sing this song to you It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift With every breath I'm singing hallelujah Hallelujah Expecting child, they searched the inn to find a place for you were coming soon. There was no room for them to stay, so in a manger filled with hay, God's only son was born. <laughs> 
Creator, the Word made flesh, our Messiah, Savior of all creation. We believe in one God who is the Holy Spirit, breath of God moving among us, who is one with the Creator, one with the Christ, our Comforter and our Guide, Mentor of all creation. Amen. Welcome to worship. I'm so glad you're here today. Do you know that I have heard all over my social media that this is going to be the worst Christmas ever? COVID is ruining Christmas. Target is ruining Christmas. I'm like, really? Really, seriously. This is not going to be the worst Christmas ever, and I'll tell you why. According to Dr. Seuss, you know, he's one of the guys I follow. Every who down in Whoville loved Christmas a lot. But the Grinch, who lived just north of Whoville, did not. The Grinch hated Christmas. The whole Christmas season. Now please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. Huh, it could be his head wasn't screwed on right. It could be perhaps that his shoes were too tight. But I think the most likely reason of all 
may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. Now, whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there that Christmas Eve hating the Who's. Boy, that sounds pretty mean, doesn't it? I don't know if I'd like to be a Grinch. How about you guys? The warm lighted windows below their town, for he knew every Who down in Whoville beneath was busy now hanging a mistletoe wreath. They're hanging their stockings. Tomorrow is Christmas. It's practically here. Then he growled, and he, his Grinch fingers nervously drumming. I must find a way to stop Christmas from coming. For tomorrow, he knew all the girls and boys would wake bright and early. They'd rush for their toys. And then, oh, the noise, the noise, the noise, the noise. Oh, the one thing he hated was noise. Well, the Who's young and small would sit down for a feast. And they'd feast and they'd feast and they'd feast and they'd feast. And, they'd feast. and they would feast on who pudding and rare who roast beef, <sighs> which was something the Grinch couldn't stand in the least. Now, we all know what happens next in the story, right guys? The Grinch decided that he was going to steal Christmas. He dressed up like a really sort of scary Santa Claus and took everything away from the Who's down in Whoville. Do we sort of feel that way with COVID? I think so. A lot of stuff is getting canceled. Um, Santa's not going to be down at the square. We couldn't have our parades. So, you know, it feels a little bit like the Grinch came in, right guys? Well, I want to tell you at the end of the story, something happened. Something unexpected for the Grinch. And the Grinch changed because he realized that Christmas was more than just the presents and the songs and the music and the noise and the feasting. Christmas was more. And guys, you know that. You all know that because you know that Christmas is somebody's birthday, right? Whose birthday is it? It's Jesus' birthday. And now we have a job to do. We have a job to actually be a Grinch, to change how we're looking about Christmas. Forget about all the stuff we're missing. Think about the things we can share. How can we make this the best Christmas ever? We can share, we can care, we can show kindness, hope, joy, and love. That's all we need to do, guys. It's that easy. So let's make it the best Christmas ever, okay? Let's pray. Thank you, God, for giving us Jesus and the gift of Christmas. Help us to remember that it's more than just getting a gift. It's more than Santa. It's more than the music and the noise. The Christmas starts in our heart. Amen. Hey guys, remember, say those prayers, wash your hands, because you know that germs and Jesus are everywhere. Bye! Our scripture lesson for this, the third Sunday of Advent, is the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 11. Hear now the word of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, 
the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend to your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. and They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations, and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation, he has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, sports fans love to debate things. Who is the greatest team of all time? Who's had the greatest batting average of all time? Who's the greatest quarterback of all time? Historians love to debate things too. Who is the greatest general of all time? Who is the greatest president of all time? But ultimately, every answer to one of those questions boils down to a certain extent to personal opinions. Here's a question that we can debate today. If you look back through all of human history since time began, what year would you say was the greatest year ever? Now, how do you begin to answer a question like that? What criteria do you use to compare and contrast this year to that year? I'm sure that we can all look back through our own lives and we can pick a year that we'd all love to go back to a year where everything seemed to be good and happy and fortunate and far less complicated than the one that we're going through right now. Maybe it's the year that, uh, that I had a job that I loved, in a town that I loved, surrounded by friends that I loved, and I met a girl that I loved who eventually became my wife. That was a pretty good year. Maybe it was when the kids were little, or maybe it was when our team won the championship. Either way, what we consider to be our best and greatest year, it's personal to us. Our favorite year may have been an absolute nightmare for someone else. So it's all relative. It's, it's opinion. Now, over the past two weeks, we have clearly established what a bad year looks like. And I'm sure we are all looking forward to flipping the calendar page from 220 to 221. And we're all hoping that the new year is better for our world than the old one. You know, I'm tempted to say that it can't get any worse, but I really don't want to jinx it at this point, so I won't. So today, though, with the help of the ancient prophet Isaiah, I want to answer the question once and for all, what is the greatest year in all human history? Now, we can say in all confidence that the greatest year in human history hasn't happened yet. Why? Because the greatest year, to make it truly great, it has to be good for everybody on the planet at the same time, not just for some. Now, ancient Israel has a name for this long-anticipated year, and they called it, and still do, the year of the Lord's favor. It was the day when God would interrupt the ongoing flow of human history and set things right. Corruption would end. Dishonesty 
would end. Injustice and unfairness would end. Suffering from sickness and poverty and hunger and death would all end. The powerful and the arrogant would be humbled and the lowly and the despised would be raised up. And Isaiah declares these now famous words. You've heard them before. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And here it is, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. And they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. The year of the Lord's favor, we know, will be good news for the poor. Now, I don't know if you have ever struggled to make ends meet in your life. Have you ever wondered where your next meal is coming from? Have you ever found yourself with no place to stay but your car or a street corner? You know, millions of people around the world today live this very way every day. Have you ever found yourself speaking the words, ah, poor people wouldn't be so poor if they just get a job? And if you didn't say it out loud, maybe you thought it once or twice. And then they get a job and they find that minimum wage doesn't provide anywhere near enough to pay for rent, food, clothing, heat, electric, and enough to take the kids to the doctor. And now that you're working, the food stamps are taken away because you make too much money to deserve the government's help. And you can't get 40 hours a week because no one wants to offer health insurance and no one wants to raise the minimum wage to provide enough for all of those things, enough to live on, because we're told that would destroy the economy. And if the government does anything to help make health care possible, it's demonized as socialism. Now, I'm not getting political here by saying this, but I want to ask the question, how do you get ahead then if you are the working poor? There are always some people, I grant you, that are unwilling to work, but the vast majority of people struggling to survive find themselves trapped in a system that feels like it is rigged against them. This relates to the year of the Lord's favor because Isaiah declares liberty to the captives an opening of the prison to those who are bound. Have you ever sat down and talked honestly with someone who was serving time behind bars? We may have very little sympathy for them. You know, if you do the crime, you do the time. You brought this on yourself. When I used to volunteer as a prison chaplain at Dauphin County Prison in Harrisburg, people used to say, why? Why go there? You know, they brought this on themselves. Well, that's true. But I remember meeting A.J. at Dauphin County Prison. Now that's not his real name, but his story broke my heart. When he and his little brother were two and three years old, they would come down to the kitchen in the morning to try to find something to eat for breakfast, and there was nothing to eat because all the money was spent on crack. Their mom was still sitting at the kitchen table from the night before with a bunch of men from the neighborhood, and they were smoking crack all night. And that's when one of the men from the neighborhood thought it would be funny to give the kids a puff of crack. Well, A.J. took a puff, and he found that it made the hunger pains feel better, so he took another puff, and then another. He was addicted to crack at age four. He was working as a drug mule at five years old to pay off his mother's debt to her drug dealer, and he was arrested in juvie by eight. A.J. spent the rest of his life in and out of jail and constantly addicted long before I ever met him. Do the crime and you do the time. But I have to ask myself, when you see the the way A.J. was raised, is that really fair? A.J. was trapped in a terrible neighborhood and in a terrible family and in an unwinnable situation. He never had a chance. And you know, he and I talked a lot behind bars about the year of the Lord's favor, and it sounded pretty good to him. 
See, we all have something that we feel trapped by. We all feel we have something that we are controlled by. Something that is larger than ourselves that we need to be rescued from and set free. What's yours? And we know that this is the mission of Jesus because he began his earthly ministry by reading the same words of the prophet Isaiah in his hometown synagogue, declaring when he was done that this word has been fulfilled today in your hearing. Jesus is good news not just to the poor and the hungry who live every day without enough to survive and thrive, but also to those who are morally bankrupt and spiritually bankrupt and don't know where to turn. He offers good news to all who are trapped in something. Maybe it's trapped behind actual prison bars like AJ, or in a loveless marriage, or in a medical condition, or a job we can't stand but we can't afford to quit. Christ has come to set us free. Christ is coming back to really set us free. Now, can you imagine what will have to change in this world that we live in to have no more poverty, no more misery and grief, no more sickness or pain, no more abuse or manipulation or violence? The rich will no longer get richer and the poor will no longer get poor. Why? Because everyone will have enough for themselves, enough to share, and the willingness to give freely to others. God has provided plenty of resources in this creation for everybody to have what they need. But some hoard up their billions upon billions while others root through garbage dumps and trash cans in order to eat it all. You see, that's got to stop. That has to change. And this requires not just a total rewiring of our societal norms and expectations. It also requires the complete rewiring of our human hearts as well. See, all this share and share like stuff, maybe it sounds a little too much like communism to you. Communism is when you are forced by the government against your will to share and share alike with your fellow citizens. But the kingdom of God is when you freely want to share because love of neighbor is part of your heart's desire. It's different. In the kingdom of God, there will be no hunger or poverty, but there will also be no billionaires either, because God runs an economy of contentment. Much like the manna that fell from the sky to feed the Israelites wandering the desert, where everyone had enough for each day, and no one could hoard up extra. That would be a very different world, wouldn't it? There will be no more sickness and crying and pain because life will now be eternal. Can you imagine that? Our bodies and our minds will no longer deteriorate, age, injure, or die. Those aches and pains with each new year, no more. No more mourning the loved ones that we've lost or fondly grieving the loss of that one perfect year in our past when life was everything we wanted it to be. But also no more wondering if God is real or what God looks like, because God will live with us face to face when that year of the Lord's favor comes. Every day will be a good day for everybody. Jesus was born to accomplish this. Jesus died to accomplish this. Jesus was raised in resurrection to accomplish this. Jesus ascended into heaven to get things ready in order to accomplish this. Jesus has anointed us, his church, with the Holy Spirit to share this good news with the poor who are trapped in a grieving world in order to accomplish this. And he's coming back to finish it and to end this struggle permanently. So I want to ask you, as we anticipate the year of the Lord's favor, the return of Jesus Christ, are you ready to be set free? Are you ready to be truly made whole? Are you ready to be truly content for the first time in your whole life? Are you ready to dry your tears and never weep again? Are you ready to live forever and truly enjoy the company of all your neighbors in the kingdom of God? Are you ready to experience life the way it was always meant to be lived? Are you ready to feel the million volts of spiritual power coursing through you as pure joy as you see the face of God face to face? 
Are you ready to see God face to face every day and simply enjoy each other's companies as friends? Well, you will. Because that, my friends, is what's next. That's how the story ends. That's why Jesus is coming back. And that's what Advent is all about. And remember, the end of this story is the very beginning of an even greater story. The greatest ever told or experienced. And when all that happens, I think we can all agree that that will be the greatest year in human history. Amen? Amen. It is time to pray. And uh, after two weeks of exploring the brokenness of this world, I don't know about you, it sure felt good to take a much closer look at the good that is already starting in the world, um, but how much better it's going to get when God has full control of everything that there is. Uh, we need this world to come. One of the last words and phrases within the, the Holy Bible near the very, very end of the book of Revelation is this phrase, come Lord Jesus, come. Uh, in Greek it's Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come. And that's what I want to pray today. That's, what I, that's what, how I want to jump into this time of prayer because whatever we are dealing with, whatever the heartbreak, whatever the betrayal, whatever the disappointment, whatever the struggle, uh, whatever it might be that you wish was different than it is, um, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come. Now remember, when Jesus comes, we may not get things, every, everything the way we want them to be. But everything is going to be the way God wants it to be. Everything the way God intended it uh, to be. So we're going to lose some stuff when that comes, but trust that what God has for us is infinitely better than what we are scratching out of this, this lifetime for ourselves. So let's welcome the coming Christ into our life, and let's be open to his return and to this coming kingdom that is going to be so much better. Let us pray. Loving God, come, Lord Jesus, come. We know Jesus told us that um, no one knows the day or the hour when he will return. Not even Jesus knows the day that he will return. Now, there have been lots of people, Lord, that have spent millions of dollars on ads and billboards telling the world, get ready because it's coming on such and such a day. And it never quite happens. Because no one knows the day or the hour except you, God, our Heavenly Father. We know that you have a day in mind. You know exactly when it is. You know exactly what's leading up to it. You know exactly how it's going to unfold. Because you are the only one who is in the past, the present, and the future at the same time. To you it is clear. To us, it's like we're peering through a fog. We want you to know, Lord, that we have tried to do things our own way for a long, long time. And no matter how hard we try, it never quite works out. We have said at First United Methodist Church of Hanover that the only rule to prayer is to be completely honest with you about what's going on inside of us and around us. To give it all over to you completely. So, Lord, we want to be honest with you about who we are, about where we are, about what we're doing, about how we struggle. We all have doubts and struggles about your kingdom too, Lord. There's some things about it we're not sure about, so we need you. We need you to come in with your grace. We need you to anoint with your spirit. Increase our faith and eliminate our fear. Forgive us of our sins, for they are many and they are great. As the church of Jesus Christ, we have sinned. We have not always been the witness to our world and our community that you have placed us here to be. Please forgive us. We have often pointed at the speck in our neighbor's eye, completely overlooking the log in our own. Please, oh God, forgive us. We have gotten comfortable in our own sense of holiness, realizing that we've got a million light years of growth to go to mature, to be even a glimpse of the holiness that you have prepared for us. So allow us to be content only in you, to trust you, to love you, to follow you, 
for the sake of our souls, for the sake of our lives, for the sake of our world and everyone in it. We pray, Lord, that you bring your good and perfect will. It's just as we pray in the Lord's Prayer that we pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we're going to go one step further, Lord, and pray for the day when Christ returns, when heaven and earth are joined together in the same place. We want that. I think it's getting closer. It's getting closer every day. Give us the patience to endure. Give us the strength of the faith to be with you. All of this we pray on this third Sunday of Advent. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to thank you all again also for the way that you have been giving and supporting First Church. Uh, just a quick reminder, because uh, those of you who've been worshiping with us online, I've heard this speech again and again and again. But there are a couple of different ways that you can give and support God's ministry through First United Methodist Church remotely. Uh, and I hope that you will. If you're worshiping at home uh, across the miles and you've not yet given to First Church um, because you're not here, would you please this Christmas do us a favor and give an extra Christmas gift to First United Methodist Church to support this ongoing broadcast right there at home. I know a lot of folks really love being able to worship at home in their jammies with a cup of coffee, um, but uh, you will be and need to be a part of making sure that that continues because we want to keep bringing this to you for a long, long time. Uh, you can give by sending a check in to First United Methodist Church. Our mailing address is 200 Frederick Street, Hanover, PA, 17331. You can call and speak to our finance office and sign up what's called automatic funds transfer. And that is like direct deposit from your bank to the church's bank. So you can schedule that any way that you would like to. Also on our church website, if you click on the giving tab, there is a, uh, a tab called uh, Easy Tithe. And that is a program that allows you to give online using a personal credit card uh, or debit card. I want to thank you for your generosity. And you know that uh, this is a time when uh, people feel a little bit more generous. And I also want to thank, and those of you who have given to the Pastor's Discretionary Fund, you know who you are. But we've had a ton of requests for aid for needy families that we couldn't fund. And a lot of money has come in this past week. It'll be gone soon as we put legs on it and make sure that we're helping the poor, helping those who struggle. Because we also want First United Methodist Church of Hanover to be good news for the poor. But that takes our generosity. And I want to thank you for being that kind of a church.
been with us today. And I want to pray that uh, something in this service was a blessing to you. That you heard something, maybe not something from me, but something through God the Holy Spirit. Because, you know, that's always the best preaching that there is. It's not what's coming out of the preacher's mouth. It's what the Holy Spirit does with it deep in your imagination. So if you found yourself in your mind maybe wandering a little bit while I was preaching today, don't worry about that. That was the Holy Spirit getting you to a place where you need to be. So whatever God has started in you today in this time of worship, I want to encourage you to continue in prayer. Keep exploring that with God. Keep Keep allowing God a little bit more room in your life, a little bit more in your mind, a little bit more in your heart uh, to see where God wants to take you. Because I guarantee you, he's taking you to a very, very good place. A reminder, in a couple of weeks, uh, we are ju- Christmas is just around the corner. Uh, we will be doing Christmas Eve two ways this year. It's going to be very different than it usually is. Uh, because we have been doing limited, modified worship in person on Sunday morning, just two small services, we will be having two small in-person services on Christmas Eve for those who feel safe enough to come. Uh, we will have to mask, we will uh, disinfect hands on the way in and go, and we will uh, insist upon on the, uh, the social distance by roping off several pews. Um, but that service will be, one will be at 7 o'clock, and the other will be at 8.30 right here at uh, Frederick Street Campus. But for the vast majority of the rest of you who are worshiping from home, because you're taking this precaution of COVID very, very seriously for you, we will have um, released earlier in the day on Christmas Eve uh, a recorded sermon, a video sermon, and worship service for Christmas Eve just like this one. So I want you to be ready for that. On that Christmas Eve service, service, we're going to celebrate Holy Communion, so make sure you have your communion elements. We're also going to do our own online version of the Christmas Eve candlelight with uh, uh, dimming the lights and singing Silent Night. So make sure that you and your family members also have some candles that you can safely light at home on Christmas Eve. So with that, I wish you a great week in Jesus Christ. I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit as we go in peace. Have a great week, everybody. Amen. (laughs) Amen.